My name is Rasmus Brun, and I am going to teach this course on Principal Component Analysis, or PCA as it is usually called. This first part will be about some background information on why and how PCA is useful, and then we will discuss a little bit the theory behind PCA, and finally treat two very important parts of validation, namely choosing the number of components and how to perform outlier detection. Let's start with a simple example of how the brain works. If we want to recognize a face, we usually don't look at variables one at a time. Let's have a look at one variable or one feature below, the nose, and try and figure out who that person might be. That's not very simple in this case. But we could look at another feature or another variable instead. For example, the eye. Or we could look at both simultaneously. And even though it helps to look at both, it's not really simple to see which person it is. But if we look at the whole image, there's absolutely no problem. It's quite simple to see who it is. So, the brain does not look at individual features. It doesn't look at the levels of the individual features, but rather it looks at the relations, all the different relations between different features. And we would like to have something similar when we look at data in different uh, problems. Let's take a more realistic example. Here we show the height of different humans and different monkeys. And we would like to be able to distinguish these two groups. And even though we do see a tendency, it's also very clear that we cannot have a cutoff level at some uh, level of the height that will help us perfectly separate the two groups. We could try and add another variable, for example the weight, but we see that the problem is exactly the same. So does that mean that these two variables cannot be used to separate the two groups? Well, let's try and see if we can find a way to look at the pattern of these two uh, variables. One simple way to do that would be to simply plot the weight versus the height. That way we get not only the levels of the individual variables, but we also get the relation between the individual variables. And as you see here, we now have a perfect separation just by plotting the height and the weight against each other. So this is the kind of pattern recognition that we are looking for when we do PCA. That way we can extract more information from the individual measurements than just the individual measurements. This is a very important principle and you're going to see that it will be useful in many different kinds of applications. So we will try to see how we can formalize this even when we have more than two variables. Another example, and an example on how this principle is used, for example, in process monitoring. Here we have a variable measured at different times, the temperature, and we can see that it varies between 25 and 50 degrees. So that's the normal range for this process, and as long as all the measurements are within those limits, the process is said to be in control. We might have another measurement, for example the pH value, and just as for the temperature, we can see that there is a certain uh, level of normal variation. So for both of these variables, we would say that the process is in control. But if we plot the two against each other, we can see that maybe that's not the case. Some points, well, they are within range for both temperature and pH, and they also have the same relation between temperature and pH as the other ones. But for this one red measurement, even though it is well within control for both pH and temperature, the relation between pH and temperature is broken, 
So clearly there's something wrong here, something that needs attention. This is a very useful concept, for example, in process monitoring, but also, for example, in medical diagnostics and a number of other situations. So we want to extend this principle because in some applications we might not have two variables, we could have three, four, five, or we could even have hundreds or thousands of variables. But we want to be able to look into that many variables and see patterns of variations. Here's an example of what is actually a quite simple uh, data set. We have different countries, 49 altogether, and then we have seven demographic descriptors of these variables. The number of infant deaths per 1,000 uh, births, number of inhabitants per physician, etc., etc. So this is a fairly small data set, but even that can be complicated to look into. And what you will see is that data in itself is not the same as information and understanding. When we have a data set like this, we want to figure out how all the different variables and all the different samples compare to each other. How do different countries differ? What variables are related to each other? What samples are related to what variables? Etc. Etc. Some very simple questions that one could ask for these data would be, for example, what European country is most similar to Japan? What country is the most strange one? These are very simple questions, but they're difficult to answer from the data. One important note here is that when we ask questions like this, or when we do data analysis in general, well, we are getting answers in terms of the data that we have. We are building empirical models based on the data that we have. So in this case, for example, we are not doing an exhaustive analysis of what differs between different countries. We are only doing that with respect to the variables that we have included. So this has to do with relevance of the data, which is outside the scope of this course, but it's a very, very important aspect to have the right data, that you know that those are relevant for the problems in question. So we will start out here simply by doing a PCA analysis and then see what comes out of that. And in order to illustrate what PCA is, let's first look at a slightly simplified example where we look at a small data set of free variables only. That will help us graphically show what's going on in the data. In the next slide you will see the movie that visualizes PCA. Here we see a table of data five samples and three variables. Every sample can be represented by a three-dimensional coordinate system. If we look at Smith, he has workload 1, so we can add a point 1 on the green axis representing Smith's workload. And if we plot the coordinate system in a normal fashion, we see that every sample, just as Smith here, will be represented by one point. And we can add all the remaining samples in this coordinate system and that way we get an exact representation of what we know, the data table, our data, in this coordinate system. Which could have had even more than three variables, but then we would have difficulties in plotting it. But we see that we can represent our data in a coordinate system without losing any information. If we look at these data, even though they are described by three variables, we can see that they almost only vary in two directions. So instead of using the original three-dimensional space, we can represent the data by a plane that will well approximate the data. In this case, we don't save a lot of uh, variables by that, but if we had more than three variables, that could, this could be a substantial saving. The way we determine this plane is in a least square sense, and as you can see, if we had oriented the plane differently, the distance of the points to the plane would have been much larger. So there's a well-defined way of 
defining such a plane. We can also project the original free axis into the plane and that way we can see how the different directions in the plane are influenced by the different variables. And this is the by plot which is the, one of the most common results of doing a PCA and which we'll look at in more detail now. In the final plot of the movie that we just saw, we saw a plane. That plane was describing what happens in the bulk of the data. That plane spanned the main variation in the data. The plot is called a biplot. It's called a biplot because it gives us a description of both variables and samples in the one and same plot. And if you have two points that are close to each other, for example two samples, well that simply means that these two samples are very similar with respect to what the plane is describing. So if that plane is describing most of the variation in the data, we can say that these two samples are very similar. On the other hand, if they are oppositely uh, placed, well that would mean that they are very dissimilar. When one is high on a certain variable, well then the other one is low and vice versa. The same goes for the variables. Two variables that are close together, well they contain more or less the same information. And a sample which for example is close to one variable, well that indicates that that particular sample has high values for that variable. We will see more interpretations of this plot uh, in the next slides, but it's a very very important uh, plot because it contains all the essential information of the PCA model. In some situations though, we don't have just a plane or a two-dimensional reduction of our data. Sometimes we need three directions, four directions, or even more. But what we always aim at is to have as few as we can possibly do with. 